if you ask what we are actively fighting for under our charter, first, a social trust white Gentile who ruled United States. Second, Gentile controlled labor union free from Jewish Moscow directed domination. The rally you just saw was held by the German-American Bund at Madison Square Gardens in 1939. Approximately 20,000 people attended, although some estimates put the number closer to 22,000. And more than 1,500 police officers were dispatched to hold back the nearly 100,000 protesters outside. Some of the rally banners read, Stop Jewish Domination of Christian Americans, and Wake Up America, Smash Jewish Communism. According to NPR, quote, one of the main speakers, Gerard Wilhelm Kuhns, the National Public Relations Director of the Bund, pointed to the white supremacy present at America's founding as a nation. The spirit which opened the West and built our country is the spirit of the militant white man, he preached. Kuhns followed the thread of racism that runs through American history to bolster his vision for a whites-only America. He cited anti-miscegenation laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Jim Crow policies, and immigration quotas. It has then always been very much American to protect the Aryan character of this nation, Kuhn's told the audience. End quote. The Boone chose that day in celebration of George Washington's birthday. They believed George Washington had been the first American fascist, and they celebrated by bathing in a mixture of decadent ceremony, white supremacy, Christianity, a warped sense of patriotism, and fascist ideology. The men you saw rush the stage in protest and get beaten by the Boone's Ordnensteins, which were essentially the Boone's version of Hitler's SS, was a 26-year-old Jewish-American man named Isidore Greenbaum. He had snuck into the rally, and while the leader of the Bund, Fritz Kuhn, spoke, Isidore, who had become increasingly angry throughout the three-hour rally, rushed the stage, shouting, Down with Hitler! Greenbaum was brutally assaulted by the Bund's stormtroopers, to the delight of the crowd, and he suffered a black eye and broken nose before being hauled off stage by the police. He would later say that despite his injuries, if given the chance, he'd do it again. Following the rally, he was charged with disorderly conduct and fined $25 by the judge, which would be the equivalent of about $450 today, quite a sum for a working-class plumber's helper and family man. During the sentencing, Greenbaum reportedly had this conversation with the judge. Quote, I went down to the garden without any intention of interrupting, Greenbaum said, but being that they talked so much against my religion, and there was so much persecution, I lost my head, and I felt it was my duty to talk. Don't you realize that innocent people might have been killed? The judge asked. Do you realize that plenty of Jewish people might be killed with their persecution up there? Greenbaum replied. End quote. Greenbaum was right. Six and a half months later, Hitler invaded Poland, and at the time of the Bund rally, he was in the process of completing his sixth concentration camp. When the United States entered the war, Greenbaum signed up to fight Nazis and attained the rank of chief petty officer. Fritz Kuhn was later arrested for grand larceny and forgery and eventually deported to Germany. Before we jump into the meat of this video, I thought I'd let you know that this video is intended to be part of a collaborative series I'm doing with Cirrus. We will be looking at past and present fascists and their movements, and seeing what we can learn from them. We will have a mutual playlist, and he'll be focusing on current day fascist leaders, sympathizers, useful idiots, and movements, while I'll be focusing on historical ones. At the end, we plan on doing a video together discussing what we've learned. So, if you haven't already subscribed to Cirrus, when you're done watching this video, please see my pinned comment or the description box, subscribe to his channel, and I hope you'll join us as we explore this important topic together. One I'd say is especially pertinent today with hate crimes on the rise, fascist leaders taking power, and political leaders with fascist tendencies, 
cropping up all over the place. Also, this series will take a lot of work and will likely be demonetized by YouTube. Any and all help via Patreon or through channel memberships will be greatly appreciated. So let's jump in and talk about some Nazis. There were Nazi-supporting organizations in the United States that preceded the German-American Bund, such as the Free Society of Teutonia, but the Bund was one of the most successful in terms of numbers. However, its immediate predecessor was founded in 1933 by Heinz Spanknobel, under the name Friends of the New Germany, and its members would include German-Americans and German nationals living in the United States. Many of the groups that came before the formation of the Friends of the New Germany were prone to infighting, and Heinz wanted to avoid that as much as possible. As a result, the Friends absorbed many of the smaller groups as they gained power and influence. They grew fairly rapidly between 1933 and 1935, managing to recruit around 5,000 members. But despite his stated objectives, Heinz turned out to be a terrible face for the organization. He threatened a local New York German language newspaper, was thrown out of the office, and later had its stormtroopers paint swastikas on the door of the local synagogues. When the German government learned of the growing public relations nightmare, they ordered Heinz to stop attracting the attention of the press, but he simply ignored them, and as a result, the government attempted to deport him back to Germany. Heinz didn't care for that idea, and ended up leaving the country before they could deport him. In 1935, members of the Friends were ordered by the German government to resign or have their citizenship revoked, which they did. But in 1936, the Friends of the New Germany would be absorbed into the German-American Bund, led by Fritz Julius Kuhn, who you saw on stage during the opening clip. Fritz Julius Kuhn dreamed of a day when he could lead a fascist America as the Bundesfuhrer. I tried to find out more about Fritz on a personal level, without much success. Besides being a deeply anti-Semitic Nazi douchebag, the only personality qualities I could find were that some people thought that if he had used his speech-making and organizational skills towards conducting legitimate business, he'd have made a great businessman. I'm not even sure that's true since he stole several thousand dollars from the boon to fuel his lavish lifestyle, but hey, maybe they were right. I mean, maybe the biggest difference was that he ended up getting caught. But we'll get to that later. Fritz had been born in Munich in 1896. He had served in the First World War as a machine gunner and had been awarded the Iron Cross. He joined the Nationalist Socialist Party in 1921 and left Germany in 1923, likely because of the poor economic prospects that faced him in the 1920s Germany. He moved to Mexico to secure work and moved to the United States in 1928 at the age of 31. He then moved to Detroit and was employed at the Ford Motor Company. He was supposedly fired for rehearsing speeches on company time and he joined the Friends of New Germany in 1933. He spoke German fluently, had experience with the Nazi party, and possessed above-average organizational and speaking skills, which allowed him to rise swiftly to district leader by 1935. In 1934, he became an American citizen. Now, it is important to note that when Fritz spoke German, he did so very well. He tried hard to imitate Hitler's hand gestures and speech patterns. However, when he spoke English, he wasn't nearly as effective. Fritz made sure to be seen in public. He had several mistresses, and he knew the value of acting and looking the part of a celebrity. The boon gradually mixed American iconography with that of Nazi Germany. Instead of the Nazi flag flying by itself, it would be flanked by American flags, and images of George Washington were used liberally. They used the slogan, Free America. And if you know anything about Nazis, you can likely guess what they were referring to when they said America needed freeing from something. They meant Jews and communists, which were often thought of as one and the same. The boon had several summer camps throughout the United States. I was able to find archived footage of some children hoisting the Nazi flag in one of those camps, as well as a few newspaper clippings talking about the Dyes Report, which would put a spotlight on those camps. At least one camp even had a road named after Hitler. These camps were essentially brainwashing centers. Children would be taught Nazi ideology, who to hate, and how to speak German. In the clip at the beginning of this video, you might have noticed some of those children standing at the rear of the stage, cheering while Isidore Greenbaum was beaten by the Boone thugs. At the height of the Boone's power, it's estimated that they had 25,000 dues-paying members, with somewhere between five to 8,000 trained stormtroopers, and that thousands more supported them in some fashion. It's unclear how many children attended the Nazi camps, but it's likely to have been a few thousand. There were approximately 18 camps, and one of those camps in Grigstown, New Jersey, hosted 200 German-American boys and girls. Another key point I wanted to bring up is that the Boone was never officially endorsed by the Nazi party. In fact, they were a bit of an embarrassment, and Hitler worried that the bad public relations associated with the group might damage relations with the Americans. Hitler was content to keep America neutral in the war, and didn't want to jeopardize that in any way. 
According to one article, quote, Although there was some unofficial contact between the Bund and Nazi officials, for the most part the Nazi government was uninterested in the organization and gave the organization no financial or verbal support. Most Third Reich officials distrusted Kuhn and the Bund, and Adolf Hitler himself made his displeasure with the organization known. On the 1st of March 1938, the Nazi government, partly to appease the U.S., partly to distance themselves from an embarrassing organization, firmly declared once again that no German citizens could be members in the Bund, and further, that no Nazi emblems and symbols were to be used by the organization. End quote. And as Nazis will often do, then and today, they sometimes made some effort to camouflage what they stood for in more respectable terms. For example, a description of the Madison Square Garden event read, quote, The Bund is opposed to all isms in American public life, including Nazism and fascism, regarding these political systems as affairs of the people who live under them, supported as they are by unerred <laughs> sick. <laughs> so yeah, Nazis can't spell. Uh, of 95% of the electors in nationwide plebiscites, but in practicable and inexpedient innovations in the American system of government. End quote. That's obviously bunk, especially if you look at the footage yourself. The boon did pose a considerable threat to American democracy. It said that they were working with other far-right groups, such as the KKK, and considering that in 1921 the German National Socialist Party only consisted of around 2,000 members, the Bund was well on its way to becoming a force to be reckoned with on the political stage. The German Nazis showed us that an ember of hate can quickly turn into a conflagration that consumes us all. The mayor of New York was upset by the violence that had happened at the Madison Square Garden event and ordered an investigation into the organization's finances. Their headquarters were raided and their books seized. Investigators found that about $14,000, which equates to about $250,000 in today's money, was missing from the Madison Square Garden event. Kuhn was arrested and charged with embezzlement. During his eventual trial, it came to light that Kuhn had spent some of the missing money on mistresses and a, quote, doctor's bill for a former Miss America. At the same time as he was being arrested for stealing money from the Bund, he was also subpoenaed by the Dyes Committee and questioned. The Dyes Committee shed a light on the activities of the Bund, including their child indoctrination attempts and their plans to spy on and sabotage the American government. The report was damning and widely publicized. Kuhn was sentenced to a two and one half to five year sentence in Sing Sing prison. He began his sentence under protective custody in a segregated cell block. He was thrown out of the Bund, but it wasn't much longer until they were dissolved completely. When America officially entered the war, it spelled the doom of the already struggling German-American Bund. I believe there are many lessons we can learn from the story of the Bund, the most obvious one being that Nazis are shit people, but we can also see how Nazis hide their true intentions until they think they have enough power to openly display their ideology or otherwise act on them. Take, for example, the conversation I recently had on Twitter, where I pointed out how the Bund had tried to sell their Nazi rally as in no way being connected to fascism or Nazism. I was immediately told that those weren't Nazi salutes, and other people had used the swastika before the Nazis. But anyone seeing the footage will, or should, quickly realize that those excuses are complete garbage. Given the context, the Nazi talking points, and so forth, it's not hard at all to tell what the German-American Bund really represented. The indoctrination camps with street names such as Hitler Street weren't based on Buddhism. Nazis are dishonest, and they often hide their vile ideology by draping it in more acceptable terms. And we will definitely be exploring that more as the series progresses. The Bund was the most visible and numerous of the American Nazi organizations, but it wasn't the most dangerous in my opinion. They were disorganized and unable to keep their far-flung chapters in line, and easily infiltrated, which occurred during the Dyes Commission. However, their dangers shouldn't be minimized either. They were quite numerous, and their views appealed to more people than we should be comfortable with. If they had managed to join forces with some of the other people we will discuss throughout this series, they may have been more dangerous still. You take me home, invite me in. The lights go down.